We have a special guest joining us here. Salute to you, Tim Cato of The Athletic, joining us now to talk Mavericks. And a good afternoon to you, sir. How the heck are you? I'm doing well. I I feel like you tell all of your guests that they're special, though. Well, uh, most of them, uh, but with you, I really mean it uh, because I love your Mavs uh, (laughs) analysis. I'll take that. I'll take that. And your insight. And, uh, man, I I feel like every time you join us, we, we talk about one way or another, what's their upside, you know, and What's their best case scenario? And all day long, uh, since Wolchuk told me you were going to join us, I've been looking forward to your answer here because we're more bullish than ever on their chances to win the title, Timmy. What say you? Yeah, I think the Dallas Mavericks have proven that they can beat any team. That doesn't mean that they're favorites. That doesn't mean that they're a, a top three team, but they are one of the they are one of the very short list of teams that I could actually see beating the Denver Nuggets in a full series. And at that rate, and especially, I, I'm so impressed with what Boston has done in the East. But they're also playing in the East. Um, they're they're a fantastic team, despite that. To be to be very clear, but I, I do think that this is a team that um, can beat anybody at its best because in any given series, it can have two of the top three players. And we know historically throughout the course of the NBA that you know star talent, that highest echelon, is what rises to the top. And you know this team over the past two months or so has has really proven it to me that there's enough around these two ridiculous star talents in Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving that, yeah, I, 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 I would not count them out. I would not rule them out against any team they face, even if, you know, they're not maybe a top three favorite by any means title contenders going into the playoffs. Team rankings wise, you have Boston up there, you have Denver up there. How many more teams is it is it two? Is it is it five? How how many are you putting ahead of the Mavs right now? That's that's the tier on top, and Oklahoma City probably comes the closest to to that top tier. But but yeah, it's it's Denver and Boston on top, and and then I think there's there's a bit of a gap, and the next tier starts, and Dallas is somewhere in that next tier. What is it? Is it is it is it size with defensive awareness and skill set that has sort of turned this thing over for us and and got it going in the right direction? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, obviously we know that the 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 trade deadline and, and the new additions and, and PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford that is that has been a huge addition. I, I think the team is uh, playing better. I, I, I think that they're you know PJ Washington and as particularly enabled this defense to make a little bit more sense. Uh, replacing him with with Grant Williams uh, just led into this team's defensive principles and, and the fundamentals that Jason Kidd wants them to play. But I also think the team overall as a whole is is more bought in, more understanding, it looks much better at executing what they want to do. And that includes players, you know, I, I think players like Derek Jones Jr., who has been great all year, you know, is is only amplified by by the way that the the team, you know, the players around us, his teammates around him are really uh, executing and, and functioning as as you know within this system that they that they build and and Gafford you know being able to go Gafford lively obviously lively has been injured for a little bit but you know just being able to keep uh you know at their peak rim presence and hopefully into the playoffs with lively hopefully returning um you know that has been something that that has improved and then Luca you know uh, Luca is better since probably the start of December than he was the first two months and he was really good back then but you know, we we are we are seeing you know a, a generational all time player uh, at the peak of, at the absolute peak of his powers so far, and uh, who knows what's to come? As we all know, only twenty five, very possibly only going to get better from here. Uh, it's a hard thing to fathom, but 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 he has been that good, and that's a huge part of this. It's been such a joy to watch him and Kyrie, and Kyrie's certainly been sensational, especially in the fourth quarter. But now you're starting to see the Luka MVP momentum start to heat up a little bit. What are your thoughts on how likely and, and where his game's kind of evolved in the last two months? I don't think he's going to win it from a, you know, someone who's in the media and just has a sense of how these, how these things go. I, I don't think this late push is, is going to be enough. I am a voter. And to me, it is very, very clearly between him and Jokic, and I don't have a decision and thankfully don't have to make it for a few more days here. And and I, I just want to emphasize, and, and I very well may end up voting Luca for all the obvious reasons for everything that we've seen him do. He is absolutely fully deserving 
to win MVP this year. I just think Jokic is also fully deserving and able to win. And for Luka to ascend to top two player, no matter how this shakes out, and you know, certainly officially, it will almost certainly shake out with Jokic on top. That's that's okay. You know, I I, I think it's fantastic the all the cases, uh, all the MVP cases that fans are making for for Luca, and they're right. He absolutely has an MVP case, and if he finishes second, that doesn't do anything to diminish, you know, what this team is, and uh, you know what what this player is, and what he what he means to this team, and. He will. His moment is is if if it's not this year, it is coming very very soon. I I am I am certain of that. Talking Mavs with the Athletics, Tim Cato here in the G Bag Nation. Do you still, Tim, view this the team's defense as a liability? No, no. I, I mean, I think, I think that looking, you know, seeing how they look against the very best offenses in a in a postseason. Uh, you know, situation is, is yeah, we, we do need to see what they look like and how high they, they can reach. And in the sense of, you know, maybe it's not quite going to be good enough to win a certain playoff series and, and that's going to be the downfall. Yeah, that that is a possibility. Obviously, the offense is, is still, uh, you know, more of this team strength in the defense. But the defense has been really good for a long enough time that absolutely I, I buy into it. Um, you know, if it has shortcomings, it's less it's less the defense itself and, and the way that it's come together. And it's more that, you know, maybe they need a little bit more top end talent. You know, maybe they need, you know, a third year Derek Lively. Uh, you know, that would be the ideal fit rather than, you know, a rookie who still shows rookie moments and is still learning. You know, maybe they need, um, you know, a, a defensive stopper that that is just a little bit, you know, level above what Derek Jones Jr. can do, or, or maybe, you know, someone who can stay on the court a little bit more because he's a little bit more, you know, has a little bit more offense to his game. But Derek, you know, Derek Jones has also been so good. And, you know, he blocked a Steph Curry three, you know, at the at the release. That's something that I have hardly ever seen. And I've watched a lot of Steph Curry and NBA basketball over over my time. This this guy is is super impressive. And then PJ Washington as the, you know, kind of Swiss Army knife on the defensive end, being able to you know, uh, guard up, you know, and that's a, that's a really important skill for, you know, your wings or your big wings, whatever you want to call PJ Washington. That's a, that's a necessary skill. You have to have a player that can, you know, comfortably, you know, spend a possession or two on a center and, and, and not completely break the defense that you're trying to play. And so absolutely, this is a, this is a very, you know, the defense we've seen is, is very real. Um, we just have to see exactly how it looks in the playoffs. It's still more of a weakness than than the offense, but it's not a weakness. It, they have proven that it's not a weakness. It's a it's a very serious defensive unit, and and that's a testament to the the trade deadline and the front office and the coaching staff. Uh, Tim is a playoff run basically in the hands of a rookie that's banged up right now, of a deep playoff run. I mean, is it is it tie is it that simple? Or are you looking at this like without him, they're a different team. Without Lively, they're a different team. With him, they're a team that could beat anybody on any given night. Let me let me put it this way. I, I think that's a little simple, and I think you also might be right. You know, I, I think that this team is 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 uh, you know, even, even since he's been out, you know, they they keep winning games. They've they won games. We've yeah. seen that. Yeah, 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 we've seen that the strengths of this team are not solely tied to that center position, but there's also a very real case to be made that the team could get into a postseason series. And, you know, if Lively isn't available, if, if he if he misses, you know, and right now it looks like the, the hope, the optimism is that at most he's going to miss a game or two mm -hmm. into the first round, but you never know for sure. Um, you know, that could be something that it was like, wow, you know, Lively's absence was really missed. This 48 minutes of rim running, physical, uh, rim protecting uh, center platoon was something that they really missed. Even with Maxi coming along, playing very well of late, uh, you know, this is definitely a big part of the team's identity. It's just having, you know, uh, Lively or Gafford on the court at all times. And so, yes and no, but absolutely the team wants and, and needs him back okay uh, it's tim cato here at the athletic how long does kyrie irving have a, a, at the absolute peak of his you know uh, abilities here and a, a stunning elite player 
uh, approaching mid thirties here. How big is this window with both these guys in like top ten form? Well, I mean, remember what he said earlier this year. He's Benjamin Button team. You yeah. know, he is. He's 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 got the most dunks of his career. Nice. You know, he's he's actually getting more athletic as he ages. I I think that Kyrie is. I I don't. You know, it's impossible to know these things, and and he has a lot of injury history. I don't think that he's someone who's going to drop off. Uh, you know, a cliff. It, it doesn't feel like. You know, he is one of the best shooters of his generation. And a lot of what he does, obviously, he is a super uber athlete. And, and that plays into it. And, you know, just because he doesn't dunk a lot, you know, this year notwithstanding, does not mean that, you know, his athleticism is a huge part of his game. But I, I think it's also something, you know, like his his handles create so much space for him in addition to his athleticism. His, you know, his shooting and his ability to, you know, toggle between a primary option role, but also being the secondary scorer next to Luca. You know, I think that's something that that is positive and beneficial for his longevity and, uh, you know, both role wise, but possibly also minutes wise. And just in terms of the, you know, the load he carries on a, on a nightly basis. And, you know, he's played the most games consecutively in his career since 2016. And that stat might be outdated. I, you know, a couple of weeks ago that was true. Now he's played, you know, a couple of weeks more more games. I, I need to check that. But, you know, I, I don't. I, I think that he's he's got some time left. I, I I don't. It's not something I worry about through the duration of his contract, with which runs two more seasons. Um, maybe we see a little slip here and there, but I, I still expect him to be a very very good player top 30, top 40-ish, and, you know, maybe the season of late, he's been even a little bit higher than top 30-ish. What have you thought about the play of THJ here as of late? I mean, he's certainly a guy that generates a lot of criticism from fans, but it seems as though he's really starting to make the right basketball plays, and he's not trying to play some of that selfish ball we've seen previously. Yeah, I think I think he deserves, yeah, he, he gets he gets a lot of vitriol from, from Mass fans, and I, I understand why. You know, and, and, you know, you can be upset at players uh, without making it personal. Um, I, I really think he deserves some plaudits for the way that he has adapted and exactly the ways you've said. I, I think his shot selection has has improved his his willingness to pass. Um, which game was it? The Oh, man, I'm blinking. A, a few games, they're all blurring together. But, you know, he made uh, to P.J. Washington, he made the, yes. you know, the game winning assist. And. You know, Golden that's State? something that I think it was Golden State. Golden State. Yeah, yeah. against Golden State. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the, I knew it was the one basketball expert the here. Games. Tim. Basketball expert. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's too many teams. Yeah, too I know. many teams. You bring it, it bring it back down to 18 and then I can remember <laughs> them all. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I think I think he deserves a, a lot of uh, credit for for adjusting his game. It's still very weird to me that that he just seems to have lost some of his shooting ability out of out of nowhere. I kept thinking it was just a slump that would turn around, and obviously it, it still really hasn't. He, it's not that he doesn't make shots, but he does not make them. He has not been making them consistently at, at the rate that he almost always has during his Dallas tenure. But, yeah, he, he's an expendable player. Dallas has tried trading him before. That That's probably almost certainly something that they're going to look to do again. We'll see what his role is in the postseason. A lot of it will depend on how he plays when he's out there. But, you know, if this team's fully healthy, I expect them to go into game one of any postseason series with a 10-man rotation. But how it gets shortened from there, whether it's just a less minutes, like maybe severely less minutes or, you know, completely falling out of the rotation, that remains to be seen, but but I, I think it's something that we can expect to happen, that, that they aren't going deep into the postseason with a 10-man rotation. They're just going to start that way. Hey, Tim, do as a fan base, do we owe Jason Kidd an apology? Um, we feel like it. I, I think I think he's <laughs> – I don't know. It's, it's a hard one to answer. What did you say about him, you know, a couple months ago? Oh, you don't want to know. Uh, you know yeah, that that, plays that's into that's it what I'm well. saying, though. I yeah. mean, I, I you know, we, we do the radio every day, and, and I think we've all been critical. I know on our end, and I think the fan base has been critical. He seems to stay the course no matter what, you know? And so yeah, and maybe, I, I maybe think... we don't want an apology for how things are going for this basketball team right now. I, I've come to – and it's not just – you know, the past month, I, I've come to over the past few years, appreciate his mindset. And I think even some of the quotes that were most frustrating, especially last season for the fan base, 
some of them I felt like were explainable if if you kind of understood his broader mindset. Um, some of them were just frustrating. Um, you know, some of them even, you know, from my space as, you know, not not a fan, but but certainly observing this, uh, I, I can't really defend. But but some of them, you know, kind of came from this the steadiness that he preaches, this this kind of zenness. Um and and I obviously the players respond to that. It, you know, everybody wanted to to know last season about you know dysfunction that was happening behind the scenes, and there really never was. And there was frustration, absolutely. There there was certainly some hot you know emotions in the locker room, but the the team did not turn on the the coaching staff by any means. Nothing close to that. And you know I think that has shown. And so I I have been impressed of of late. I think that he is doing a good job coaching this team and. I think generally the the one thing that we can take away is that he does a pretty decent job coaching when everything comes together in the way that he wants it to. Um, you know, his his drawbacks as a head coach may be when things aren't going well. And we saw that last season where, you know, I do think he did a bad job. But now this season, especially post uh, trade deadline, when he has the roster and the players that he wants to execute the ideas and vision that he has, we have seen it work very well. So I do think he's good at that. It just may be that He's not as adaptable or adjustable or able to, you know, fix something that isn't going in the exact ways that he wants it to um, as as some other coaches. Terrific insights. Once again, Tim, enjoy covering this team, man. It's, I think it's a special time with what they're capable of doing. Yeah, I might be working into uh, to late May, you know, nice. yeah. beyond. Nice. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to see, but I'm, I'm mentally prepping for it. Let's so. go. Thank you, Tim. Have a great time and we'll catch up with you soon. Tim, Absolutely. Tim Talk soon.